So uh, we had two lectures on essentially building up to um, understanding sheaves, their deformation theory, and virtual cycles. If I lost you, which I'm sure I did, just take that now as a black box. This, uh, there's this, cur this virtual cycle which plays the role of the fundamental class of the moduli space, has good properties. If you perturb things, um, it, uh, it stays the same, it's deformation invariant. Um, it's the correct fundamental class for this moduli space. Okay, and now we're going to apply it in waffer witten theory. But um, we had Lothar's lecture, right? So uh, maybe I just skip this and uh, go on to the next lecture. No, okay, we'll go, we'll go through it. Uh, so there's this paper hundreds of years ago by these guys. Uh, and Donaldson even gave it to me in my thesis and, uh, during my PhD and told me I, I ought to think about making mathematical sense of it. It was around the time of Donaldson theory. Uh, well, it was, it, was sort of a, it was around the time of Cyborg Witten theory rewriting Donaldson theory. <coughs> so at the time, there were all these gauge theories in physics which were leading to really exciting mathematical, rigorous mathematical invariants like Donaldson invariants. Um, and the idea was, could you do something with this? And, uh, you know, for 25 years, the answer was no. Uh, fundamentally, because there's no natural way to compactify the moduli space here and therefore get invariants. Okay, so very briefly, you're not meant to follow this. Don't take notes. Um, this is um, a theory given for a, four man a real four manifold, like a Riemannian four manifold. Um, you pick auxiliary data, a bundle over it, uh, and then you're supposed to count solutions of these gauge theory equations. And you're not meant to really understand what they are, but just roughly, you've got something here which is the, the self-dual part of the curvature, which is what's relevant to Donaldson theory, um, which is what's relevant on a Kähler surface to um, via the, the Hitchin-Kobayashi correspondence or donaldson ullenbeck yau theorem. It's what's relevant to um, stable bundles. Uh, and then you've got some, Higgs, some ad ad additional fields, which we'll incorporate in one field later on and call the, call the Higgs field. Okay, and then you're supposed to count solutions of these equations, and th that's the tricky bit, how to do that, but let's assume you could do that. Then there's this sort of voodoo in physics which says that when you form a generating function or, f you know, Fourier series or something of these invariants, these counts, uh, then you should get modular forms. And so in particular, this sort of infinite collection of numbers should be determined by only finitely many numbers. And so in the Kähler case, so, uh, so we still can't define waffer witten invariants, I should say. But there's been some very recent progress of some physicists defining them in other ways using TQFTs, and now more progress on really using the equations and almost complex structures. So uh, th there's some hope now that maybe one day we'll be able to define these invariants. But what these lecturers are about are defining them in the, the algebraic case or the Kähler case. And, and so the, pr the problem is that the moduli space is inherently non-compact. These, these uh, fields can grow. And you'll see that better in the algebraic case in a minute. So from now on, I'm going to work on a Kähler surface or an algebraic surface from the next slide onwards. I'll call it S. So that's my four manifold. And then you can, um, you can package these fields in a certain nice way using the splitting of two forms on a Kähler surface, and you end up with these equations. So this is the integrability condition, which says that your connection defines a holomorphic structure on your bundle. And then this is a moment map equation, which tells you how to fix the metric on that bundle. And then this says that your Higgs field is holomorphic. <coughs> so you end up with this. Um, this data. Okay, so again, you're, you're not really supposed to be paying too much attention yet. And then there's a Hitchin Kobayashi correspondence. Um, so people have proved that the solution, at least in the algebraic case, uh, that the solutions correspond to the following data. So this rather linearizes the problem and simplifies it. So this is where you have to start paying attention. So th this is what the Waffer Witten equations are for us. So they're the data of a vector bundle over our complex surface and a Higgs field there's this twisting by the canonical bundle of the surface <coughs> the Higgs field should be trace free and the determinant of the bundle should be fixed 
And then there's a stability condition that ensures that you can solve this equation here. So you get rid of this nonlinear equation by, uh, by uh, uh, seeing it as a moment map. This is uh, annoying. So you, you see this uh, middle equation here as a moment map equation, and then you can solve it um, so long as the, this holomorphic data satisfies a stability condition. Okay, and the stability condition is the same slope stability that we used in the first lecture, except this Higgs field here modifies it so that instead of testing via all sub and quotient bundles of E, and you, testing their slopes, as we did in the first lecture, you only take those invariant by phi. So you take phi invariant sub-bundles of E, and you check that the slope is less than the slope of the quotient. And that's the stability condition. Okay, and, yeah? Previous notation, the previous, yeah. Is it omega 1, 1? I think this component on this, right? Is it? Here? Here? <laughs> omega 1, 1? Uh, what would omega 1, 1 mean? One, 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 comma, one. This one. What, yeah, what would that mean? So you decompose this. So originally this is kind of, you put this omega one, one. So, so omega here is the Kähler form, so it's already a one, one form. So, so this wedge here is a four, four, a two, two form, four, four. Okay, so, yeah, ignore everything I said. Here's what we're interested in, in algebraic geometry. You know, analysts have done a hard job for us, and now we can forget about the equations, and we can reduce it to studying um, a st stable Higgs pair. So there's a, the bundle, field, endomorphism, twisted endomorphism, satisfying a stability condition. And uh, one of the kind of insights that this work has produced is that you shouldn't, um, bizarrely, you shouldn't take slope stability. You should take Giesecke stability because otherwise it's all a mess and you get the wrong answer. So that's the first thing we'll do is we'll replace slope stability by Giesecke stability or semi-stability. Um, <coughs> and um, the, the second thing is this means we can partially compactify things by um, allowing E to be a torsion-free coherent sheaf instead of a vector bundle, so that will partially compactify the moduli space, which gives us more of a chance of defining an invariant. But you'll still have non-compactness because you can scale this phi. If you just scale phi, if it's non-zero, uh, then you'll get another solution. Okay, so exercise. When the degree of the canonical bundle is negative, stability, that stability condition I told you, forces the Higgs field to vanish. Okay, I mean, very roughly, it's a map from a vector bundle to a more negative vector bundle. Um, and so you, by taking kernels and co-kernels and so on, you can prove this rather easily. Um, so uh, Waffer and Witten have a, um, a vanishing theorem that essentially, when, when the curvature of the manifold is positive in some sense, then... Um, you get this vanishing theorem that all the Higgs fields, those Bs and gammas and whatever, you vanish and you, you get reduced to the anti-self-dual equation considered by Donaldson. And this is the complex analog of that. Okay, so in this case, the moduli space is compact and you can do something, but otherwise it's tricky. Yeah? Uh, what do you mean by partially compactify? Um, partially compactify? Uh, <laughs> a slightly bigger space which is a bit closer to being compact, but isn't compact. Yeah. I don't mean anything. Ignore it. See what the meaning of the zero is? Of e e yeah, trace free. Trace of phi should vanish. But the, the trace is a, a section of chaos. Yeah, that's right. OK, so what we're going to consider actually is the moduli space ah so yeah so when this vanishing holds then what we end up with is a moduli space just of stable sheaves so this is what you get in Donaldson theory on a projective surface with fixed determinant maybe trivial determinant and then what you find as we'll see in the next lecture and as Lotar mentioned is that the waffer witten invariant is some kind of Euler characteristic or virtual Euler characteristic of this moduli space and there was a lot of work 
for starting back in 1994 and going on about computing these numbers and seeing modular forms and so on. But really what this lecture is about is the other components when, the, when phi is non-zero. But uh, we, we'll get to that. The reality of a, of a determined bundle falls from the fact that we consider a few R bundles? Or? Yeah, but, but you don't have to do it. Later we'll, we'll fix the determinant to be a line, just a line bundle. Then. But it is it, sort of, this is in the, you know, this is to do with the Lie algebra of SUR and this is to do with the group SUR. So here you fix determinant and here you take trace free. Right, this, this is where I really want to start the lecture. So this is the cool thing. You know, it, those of you who know about Higgs bundles on curves or Hitchin systems or something will know this. The rest of you won't know this and you're really missing out. It's just a beautiful piece of mathematics. Um, it explains what matrices are. So uh, pay attention. Okay, so uh, we, we have this data. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to turn it into data on a bigger space, on the canonical bundle of S which we call X. Okay, so this is a Calabi R threefold. So this data is equivalent to a, a certain torsion sheaf, so a, a two-dimensional sheaf supported on a surface called the spectral surface, uh, which is some kind of multi-covering of the surface itself. Okay, is everyone happy with this picture? The vertical lines are the canonical bundle of S. And um, roughly speaking, this torsion sheaf is a line bundle on this spectral surface. Okay, so for now this is just the rough idea and then we do it rigorously. So what, what is this? Roughly speaking, you, the, the red points here, let's work on one fiber, okay, so one point of S. So what do you have? You have this endomorphism, phi. So what you do is you plot its eigenvalues. There it's three. This is the rank three case. You plot its three eigenvalues in Ks. There's always this twist by Ks. And what do you put over those eigenvalues? You put the eigenspace in E. Okay? So there's, there's an eigenspace in E. So that's some line in E at this point. Over there, there's one over there, and there's one over there. And then you put it all together in a family, and this gives you a line bundle over this surface. All right? That's somehow the generic situation. In reality, this surface might be, you know, some thickened version of S, or it might just be S itself with a, a high rank bundle on it instead of a, li a line bundle. So it's more complicated, but that's the rough idea. So any questions about that? Okay, so we're, next we're going to do it rigorously, but first we're going to do it over a point. So we're going to understand a vector space and an endomorphism. All right, so we're going to understand what matrices are. So we fix a vector space and an endomorphism. Um, and so I'm always working over the complex numbers. So V is a C module. But now we've just made it into a CX module because X, or, or a C phi module. We just let X act through phi. Phi commutes with itself, right? So this is, this is a commutative thing. It's really a CX module. OK, but we know what CX modules are. They're sheaves on the affine line, on spec CX. And the fact that V is finite dimensional means that the sheaf has finite dimensional sections. So it's really, it's a torsion sheaf. It's only supported on a finite number of points. Otherwise, it would be, have infinite, it would be an infinite dimensional module. OK, so we get a torsion sheaf supported, maybe exercise, check you're happy with this, that it's supported on the eigenspaces of phi. Okay, that's why spec is called spec. It's spectrum. It's to do with eigenvalues. Now, eigenvalues, the, the points of spec CX are the eigenvalues of the operator X. Okay, so exercise. Uh, so this is really worth doing. Um, this is really, you know, exercise about matrices. So here's a silly matrix, multiple of the identity. That corresponds under the spec correspondence, check you're happy that it really corresponds to two copies of the structure sheaf of the point lambda, uh, so the, of the eigenvalue. Okay. Whereas, if you take this Jordan normal form, what does this correspond to? So really check what module this gives you over CX and what sheaf that corresponds to. What you should find is 
It's very similar, but it's not the same. It's the structure sheaf of the thickened point, two times lambda, the double point at lambda. So it should actually be su supported on eigenvalues of phi, right? Not yes. as in spacing. Oh, sorry. Well, uh, eigenvalues. Thank you. Yeah, I'll correct that. Thank you. OK. And more generally, another exercise. Th this explains the, sort of the difference between the minimal polynomial and the characteristic polynomial. The module is actually supported on the zeros of the minimal poly polynomial, scheme theoretically. But its divisor class is given by the characteristic polynomial. So I don't have time. So ask someone, if you don't know what the divisor class of a, a module is, then ask someone. Or uh, this is also called the fitting support or fitting ideal or, yeah. But I, um, I can only go through so many things, so I, I'm not going to go over that. There's a very nice, pretty story. Someone could explain it to you very quickly. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by generalized eigenspaces? Oh, um, the generalized, sorry, uh, a generalized eigenvalue is something that, is, so is lambda such that phi minus lambda to some power is zero, not just phi minus lambda is zero. And then the eigenspaces are the things that are killed by this phi minus lambda. Did I say that right? No, I didn't say that right. I said that wrong. So, so, it's, uh, so, um, so lambda is a generalized eigenvalue and v is a generalized eigenvector if phi minus lambda times the identity v, but maybe you have to do that n times, is zero. That's the condition. Yeah. Okay, so now we want to do this rigorously and globally. So globally, what we do is we take our sheaf E on S with its uh, Higgs field phi, okay, and we make it into a pi star OX module. So we push down the functions, down the fibers, and we get this, this. This is just a polynomial, you know, always think over a point. This is just a polynomial ring in X. Um, and you make it into a module over this, uh, by using the fi by using phi to the i, that's how you describe um, the action of this guy, this graded ring, on e via this here, and it's obviously it's all commutative because phi commutes with phi to the i. Okay, and so what you end up with is a pi star of O x module, and so what is that again via the relative version of spec? Um, that is a sheaf, in fact, yeah, it's a sheaf over x. And it turns out the stability condition I, I told you about is equivalent to stability for this sheaf. Okay, so we're interested in, I'll just say it, it's not so important. We're interested in Giesecke's st stability for E phi. That's that um, where you look at the reduced Hilbert polynomial of phi invariant subsheaves. That's equivalent to the Giesecke stability of this curly E phi, this spectral sheaf, um, which is to do with uh, the reduced Hilbert polynomial of subsheaves on X of E phi. So stability matches up, and I won't go into the details. All right, so exercise. I really advise doing this one. Uh, this is nice. So describe a Higgs pair on just the affine line. So this is really uh, one dimension down. So this is really sort of Hitchin theory uh, with spectral curve y squared equals x. So you really want to see this branching, this non-trivial branching. And it's non-trivial. You see, what, what, that, what does that mean, the spectral curve y squared equals x? Uh, so y is the eigenvalue, and it's got to be square root of x. Well, square root of x is not a well-defined function. It has monodromy, it's multiply valued. So you can't just write a diagonal matrix, square root of x, square root of x. All right? You've got to work harder than that. Um, and you know you can't diagonalize it because you can diagonalize it away from the branch point, but at the branch point, 
you're getting this uh, double point vertically, and we know that that's supposed to correspond to a Jordan normal form. So you can't, yeah. Uh, we have a question about Eugene. Do you need the sun condition that support as a finite uh, and flat morphism to S? No. It, it all comes out in the wash. There's no, there's no conditions here at all. This is an equivalence of categories. I mean, I haven't set up one of the categories, but it, it's absolutely fine. Everything just comes out in the wash. And I have also a question. You assume that f wedge f is equal to zero, like in... Uh, phi, phi wedge phi? Yeah, phi wedge phi. Uh, you, you don't have to because um, you, you, don't, uh, you don't have a one form here. Uh, where was phi? Yeah, there or before, because... Because phi is already a two form, so you can't, there's no wedge. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's right. In general, you would have to do that. Um, you, have, you need some commutativity property. Okay, so you're going to get this branching. So the hint for this question is that um, a matrix is determined essentially by its, um, its trace and determinant. Okay, so if you want eigenvalues square root of lambda and minus, squ oh, sorry, square root of x and minus square root of x, you know what the trace and determinant are, and so now I think you can write down the right matrix, which, will, which is well defined and is mu not multiply valued. Okay, and then exercise, do the same for y squared equals x squared. So now there's no branching, but you can do two different things. You can describe one, you can describe two different spectral sheaves on that spectral surface. One of them corresponds to a diagonalizable Higgs field and one corresponds to a non-diagonalizable Higgs field with a non-trivial Jordan normal form. They're really great exercises. Okay, conversely, if I have one of these torsion sheaves supported over a surface, uh, it'll be compactly supported. So that's, the, um, that's relevant to the question online. Um, the, what the, this is an equivalence to compactly supported sheaves on X, okay? So if you have a compactly supported sheaf on X, then you recover a sheaf on S by pushing down, by taking sections. And then you can recover the Higgs field by the action of um, the sort of the tautological endomorphism which you have on X. So, you know, at every point of X gives you a section of this line bundle. There's a tautological section of this line bundle, Ks, or it's pullback, um, on Ks, right? So it's zero here, and it's one here, and it's two here, and so on. All right. If you multiply that by the identity, you get a sort of a, you get a canonical endomorphism, which is zero on the zero section and one up here, and so on. Okay. Um, that's the thing which gives you the Higgs field. So it turns out that Higgs pairs are entirely equivalent to compactly supported torsion sheaves on X. All right, so, so now we've reduced this Waffer-Witten thing to you can describe it either by Higgs pairs or you can describe it by torsion sheaves on a certain local Calabi R threefold, non-compact Calabi R threefold X. And here you see the non-compactness, right? The, I mean, X is non-compact. You can scale the Higgs field you can stretch everything in the KS directions and you can see it's inherently non-compact. You could try and compact projectively complete it or something, you'd, you'd lose the calabi out condition. Um, it's not clear whether that's a profitable thing to do. Um, it probably is and, you know, maybe you could study it. Yeah? You have a question. Does the spectra construction work more generally with an arbitrary line bundle instead of... Yes, it does, yeah. Yeah, there's nothing special about the canonical bundle here. Okay, and then what we're really interested in is two conditions. Remember, we're dealing with SUR, not UR. And what that means is we want to fix the determinant of E and take the trace of phi to be zero. And what that corresponds to is that the determinant of the pushdown of E should be trivial, so that's kind of not really a translation at all. But the trace phi being zero is this condition that this spectral sheaf has sort of center of mass zero on each fiber. So where, you know, you would have to make sense of the center of mass. So in this case, it would be sort of this point of the fiber plus this point of the fiber plus this point of the fiber. But more generally, you know, you might have um, on the spectral surface might, instead of being sort of three to one, 
it might just be one-to-one -one and you have a rank three bundle on it instead of a line bundle on it. So that's the case where your, your matrix is a multiple of the identity. And in that case, you have to weight those points by three. So uh, you have to make sense of this center of mass. The easiest way is to just say trace phi equals zero. That's the best way of making sense of this center of mass. Okay, so th that's so you can forget everything up until now and just say waffer witten theory is about these spectral sheaves, these sheaves on X, which satisfy this strange condition. Okay, they have this sort of center of mass zero on each canonical bundle fiber, and uh, there's a condition on the determinants of the push forward. Should we view this as some sort of Adamism map? Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, if you take the, the divisor class, yeah, 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 you could do that. There's probably a, a way of formalizing that. Okay, so uh, we want a virtual cycle on this thing, and then we've got to deal with non-compactness. Okay, so I, t I already said this about stability. We're going to use Giesecke stability, and the first thing we're going to do, like in the last lecture, is we're going to assume for simplicity that there's no strictly semi-stables. So we're going to assume that anything that's semi-stable is actually stable. That's just to start with. And then what you find is the deformation theory, we've already done that, of compactly supported coherent sheaves on uh, Clavier threefold is perfect. It's also got a certain symmetry. So it's the same as before. There's deformations, obstructions. They happen to be dual to the deformations. This uh, gray piece is sort of for later. That's, that's when you keep track of the C star action. Then if you know what this is, this, this is when you keep track of the C star action, I'm just tensoring with the one dimensional standard character of C star there, the standard representation, weight one representation of C star. So that comes in. I, w the point is that this Calabi-Yau threefold has a holomorphic three form on it, and the C star action of scaling the fibers does not preserve that holomorphic three form, it scales it by a factor, or weight one or minus one. That's important. Assume this date is trivial, volume form is kind of trivial, then uh, the this framework is kind of contradiction? No, that was the determinant of the bundle. Whereas this is the holomorphic three form on X. Okay. And there's no higher obstructions, at least once you take trace free. Um, and I'm making Dennis nervous now, but it can all be handled. Um, okay, and therefore it inherits a virtual cycle. And that's essentially what the last two lectures were about. Um, and, you know, there's my picture. Remember all this? Okay, so there's, there's a way of describing the, the moduli space via Kuranishi models. They give you these graphs, and you make them vertical, you get a cone in a vector bundle, and you intersect that with the zero section. Okay, and so you get a zero-dimensional virtual cycle. So this is essentially some kind of DT theory. Okay, but M is non-compact, just as X is non-compact. So really the virtual cycle vanishes, it doesn't make much sense. But we're going to use this C star action where we scale the fibers, the canonical bundle fibers, or equivalently we scale the Higgs field phi. You can work in on X or you can work on S with Higgs pairs. It, it doesn't, they're equivalent. And you know, at various points in these papers we switch from one to the other. There's various things which are very convenient in one picture and Various things are impossible in one picture and very convenient in the other. And now the C star fixed locus is compact, and that's essentially because the fixed locus of C star on X is compact. It's the original surface. Is the virtual cycle really zero? I mean, yeah, that, I think that's not quite true, actually. Yeah. yeah, we could talk about that after. I mean, if it would be zero, then the localized one would be. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, it's not a great thing to work with, let's just say that. Okay. And in fact, in the K-theoretic setup in my last lecture, there's really no difference between the non-compact and the compact. So. But you have to use the C-star action. Yeah, so in equ let's say it's uninteresting and one should use the equivariant version. And then, and then it becomes interesting. Anyway, 
Okay, so the C star fixed locus is compact because the C star fixed locus is those sheaves which are really supported on S, but only set theoretically on S. They can be supported on some scheme theoretic thickening of S. Okay, we come to that soon. So we're getting sheaves supported on S, and S is compact, so you end up with a compact moduli space of sheaves. And so because it's compact, what we can do is we can just apply the virtual localization formula and we can integrate. Oh <coughs> so again, this was something I thought long and hard about whether I was going to discuss localization. Eventually, I decided I didn't have time. And Lothar already did it. So, uh, you know, when, when you're doing uh, integration, when you're dealing with cohomology of a variety with a C star action, a circle action, most of the information is contained in the fixed locus. You can localize integrals to the fixed locus. And so we do that here, even though maybe the integral might not make sense on the non-compact thing, we just pretend it's compact, use, apply the localization formula, and we get an expression on the fixed locus. And because this does make sense, there's some kind of regularization of the integral on the non-compact thing, uh, we just take this as our definition, all right? And because we've localized, that involves inverting certain things, like this. <laughs> um, so we end up uh, inverting integers. It turns out we end up with a rational number. Even though we're assuming that there's no strictly semi-stables, we end up with a rational number. And don't you have to take some residue? Um... Yeah, that's the, the, yeah, this is called, kind of called a residue. Yeah. Anyway. Do you mean like a residue of a, a function of t, yeah. like the coefficient of t inverse? No, it turns out because the virtual dimension is zero, you're taking the constant coefficient. And actually, because the virtual dimension is zero, this integral really is constant inside q of t. Exercise. We have yeah. A question by Dima. Is this equivalent to the cosection construction of virtual classes? No. No, it, it's, this is a bit like the question yesterday, is that can you define this via bare end functions and weighted Euler characteristics? So um, I refer, which Dima? Uh, Svonkin. Ah, I referred uh, Dima to, you know, the original papers where we defined two invariants, one via bare end functions and weighted Euler characteristics and one in this way using virtual cycles. Because of non-compactness, they're not the same. And, you know, for, for a long time we worked with both. And then we did computations which showed that to get the numbers that physicists get, you have to take this definition, not the other one. And the cosection that he's referring to is um, much more closely related to the bare end function, I think. So anyway, for, for now I say no. All right, so this is really just a, what's called a local DT invariant. But this is really the UR waffer witten invariant because I haven't fixed determinants and um, center of mass zero and trace zero and so on on this particular slide. Um, and so what you find is this is kind of uninteresting. Like the moment S, this is fine if um, the cohomology of S is very simple. For instance, when you have the vanishing theorem. So if the canonical bundle of S is uh, negative, then this is a fine definition, and it really is the waffer witten invariant. But in general, for general S, like general type S, for instance, this invariant is always zero. And that's to do with the action of the Jacobian of S and this extra piece in the obstruction theory of S. So um, I, left, I leave that as an exercise. That's a trivial exercise for people who know a bit about obstruction theories and duality and so on. And it's an impossible exercise for most people, so ignore it or ask someone and they can explain it to you. It's one of those things that's completely trivial when you see how to do it. But you would never see how to do it. Okay. So what we really want to do is define an SUR waffer witten invariant. That's going to have more chance of being non-zero. It's much more interesting. And it's not just a DT invariant, so it's something new. Okay. So what we do is we take this moduli space, which I call M perp of those E with center of mass zero and this fixed determinant condition. Okay? Equivalently, we take, instead of all Higgs pairs, we take those Higgs pairs, or stable Higgs pairs, with trace zero and fixed determinant. 
And, and you can relax this OS and fix just any old line bundle. That's fine. Okay. So I won't go through too much of this, but um, turns out you can, you can change the deformation theory. You see, the deformation theory of the sheaves on X, these torsion sheaves, was governed by this X group here. And what you can do is you can prove there's a splitting. You can take out a piece. So this first piece, the cohomology of OS, that governs the deformation theory of the determinant of the pushdown of E. So the determinant of the straight E on S. The deformation theory of that is the deformation theory of a line bundle. So you get uh, X from a line bundle to itself, but that's just um, the cohomology of the structure sheaf, right? This is, so this structure sheaf here is the endomorphism sheaf of the line bundle determinant of E, right? So this is what governs, this first piece governs the deformation theory of that line bundle that, I'm fi that I want to fix. So I'm going to remove it. The second piece governs the deformation theory of the trace of the Higgs field or the centre of mass of the spectral sheaf. And then the third th piece is what's left over, and you can pro prove there's a canonical direct sum decomposition, and that is what governs the deformation theory of my SUR Waffer-Witten Higgs pairs or um, sheaves with centre of mass zero. Okay, so if you wish, again, this is more for experts, I think. Um, here's an exercise you can deduce this, at least point-wise, in the following way. There's a certain resolution of our spectral sheaf, okay, um, by, you know, remember this is an eigenspace and this is the vector space, so this is just the map from the vector space projecting to the eigenspace by projecting out all the other eigenspaces. But this is just, a, this is just the obvious adjunction. This takes the sections of a sheaf to the sheaf evaluation of sections, okay? And what's the kernel? Well, again, intuitively, this is kind of clear. There is no kernel generically. Generically, E phi is zero. It's a torsion sheaf. But this kernel, when you're at a point where phi minus lambda or phi minus tor, tor is the eigen, remember, tor is the sort of the tautological eigen um, function. So where phi minus tor has some kernel, or it's rank drop, so it has some kernel and co-kernel, that kernel or co-kernel is the generalized eigenspace. And so that, that gives you this resolution. Uh, there should be an identity times that tor, really. So, so, where, so at the points where tor, where, where how far you up the are up the canonical bundle, is equal to an eigenvalue of phi, then this operator here suddenly drops rank and it has some co-kernel and that is the eigenspace and that's what that's exactly what this resolution says all right so it's an exercise to prove it it's quite it's a pretty tricky exercise but it's in our paper um, uh, the original paper with Tanaka okay and then maybe maybe a, um, a more manageable exercise much easier is just to take x from this sequence to E, E phi, curly E phi, okay? And then you get this user junction and you get this long exact sequence here. And this is what tells you how to relate the deformation theory of the Higgs pair to the deformation theory of the sheaf. So in the middle here is the deformation theory of the sheaf on X. Um, a sub is the deformation theory of the Higgs field. So as I deform phi, as I change phi, I deform E phi. And as I deform E phi, by pushing down, I deform E on S. And not every deformation of E on S gives me an E phi because I might deform my E on S and not be able to deform the Higgs field with it. There may be an obstruction to deforming the Higgs field, and that's this last arrow here. And this is the obstruction space for the Higgs fields. Okay, and now using this, you see, you can see these pieces. So the cohomology of OS uh, comes from this third term here. 
So it comes from taking trace or identity. It sits as a summand in this x one of straight E, straight E on S. It sits as a summand in there using the trace and identity maps. And instead of talking about deformations of E, it's talking about deformations of DETI. And it's said dual, because everything has this duality, it's said dual, which is the cohomology of KS, is sat in the first piece. Again, as a summand via trace and identity maps. Um, it, it's sat there in, in terms of the Higgs field. It's the trace part of the Higgs field. And, and then uh, the perp is what's left over. Yeah? Uh, for x1, could you view that uh, second sum as, a, as a, uh, the one that comes from the singularity map? Or it's, uh, well, here? Uh, uh, the the, the, the uh, blue, blue lines. Here, yeah. Yeah, the second sum and uh, this one. Yeah, so it's for x one is gonna be h. Uh, yeah. For, for x two, uh, for x two, so for the abstract. Yeah, I think yeah. yeah, it certainly has that flavor, and I bet you could do it. Yeah, okay. it's not how we do it, but you could do it. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, you could do it that way. Okay, so I think I said this already. All right, so what you end up proving is that this M perp, this SUR Waffer Witten space, also has a nice perfect obstruction theory, virtual dimension zero. It has this symmetry. And you can make the same definition as before, and you get a Waffer Witten invariant. And uh, OK, here's a, here's a you know, six month exercise if anyone wants to do it. I, I'm not sure how valuable it would be, but it's. An alternative way of defining this perfect obstruction theory in the rank two case would be to take the fixed locus sort of, of, of dualizing and uh, applying minus one on the fibers. So um, you can dualize your E phi on its support. I mean, you can write that actually on X in terms of X to one instead of HOM, but anyway. Um, you can dualize that line bundle, that spectral line bundle. Um, and apply minus one to the spectral surface. And then the, uh, the fixed points of that should give you this M perp. And you know that Graeber and Panda, Panda told us how to pass from a perfect obstruction theory to a perfect obstruction theory for a fixed locus under a group action. So that would give you a more immediate way of constructing this perfect obstruction theory. Two yeah, but you can surely adapt what they did. The only reason I say this is because, you know, this slide is hiding like really 30 pages of hideous deformation theory. I mean, we should have found an easier way of doing it, but we never did. And this is one easier way of doing it in the rank two case. It turns out to be really, really hard to de define this, this X perp perfect obstruction theory. Can one take some sort of derived fiber? Uh, uh, yeah, that's another, uh, we also discussed that in the paper. Yeah, if, if you, we couldn't do that honestly because we didn't have the, expertise but yeah if you if you're happy to um say infinity derived algebraic geometry homotopy something then yeah you could do that hopefully it goes away in a second all right so just treat it as about black box there's this virtual cycle there's this uh, we localize the fixed locus the c star action and we define an invariant, all right? And what these lectures are about is essentially how you compute this and what the two contributions are. Now, there are two different types of contribution to this, as Lothar mentioned. There are two types of fixed locus, okay? One is where phi is zero. That is obviously fixed under the C star action. So that corresponds to sheaves on X, which are scheme theoretically supported on S. They're pushed forward from S. So they're not line bundles on S, they're really rank R sheaves on S pushed forward to X. So that's the most degenerate case where the Higgs field is zero. And then the exercise is to show that you can also get fixed pairs from nilpotent phi. So when you that's essentially down to the fact that when you scale a, a Jordan block with zeros and just a one in the corner, when you scale that one to a lambda, 
it's simi similar, it can be, it's, what's the word I'm looking for? It's similar to itself, right? If I put, you know, this matrix, can be conjugated to this matrix under an endomorphism. So what you need is an endomorphism of your E, which is possible because E isn't strictly stable. E is only stable when you pair it with the Higgs field. Um, so you can have an endomorphism of E which takes this to this. So when you scale your Higgs field by an element of C star, you end up with a, a similar Higgs field. So um, you end up with an isomorphic Higgs pair. It's, it's easier to see the C star fixed low psi in the sheaf on X language rather than the Higgs pair language. So on X, what you're doing is you're taking sheaves which are supported on a thickening of the zero section. You can see those could be C star invariant. They're not all C star invariant. But the structure sheaf of a thickening of S, for instance, is C star invariant. So we get a decomposition of the C star fixed locus into two pieces, the so-called instant on branch. So this is sheaves with fixed determinant on S. This, um, this corresponds to solutions of the anti-self-dual equation by the Hitchin-Kobayashi correspondence. Yeah? Actually, a follow-up problem. Why do you need this kind of C-star action here? It's Just to make things compact. That everything's non-compact. You can't define invariance because of that. But by localizing to the fixed lo locus of the C-star action, you get a compact situation where you can, where you can define things. And then what we call the monopole branch on which phi is nilpotent rather than zero. So these are the sheaves supported scheme theoretically on S and these are the sheaves supported set theoretically on S but not scheme theoretically on S. Oh yeah, I said that. And I said that. So the waffer witten invariants are some of these two contributions and then um, they seem to be swapped in a certain sense by the S duality voodoo predictions of physics. Or this is some non abelian version of electromagnetic duality. Uh, those are just words that, are, you know, that's some kind of jargon that I heard. And it Eugene is asking a, a question. Yeah. If phi is equal to zero and the modulus space of she's on S is moot, is it easy to describe the virtual cycle? Yeah, we, we're, doing, we're going to do that next. And Lota did it yesterday. <laughs> okay, there's my answer. Now we're going to do that next. Okay, so I'm going to focus on the monopole locus because the, the other locus, the instant on branch, is where people made lots of progress over 20, 25 years and um, the, the latest progress is, is by Lothar and uh, Martin Kuhl, and uh, a lot is known about that. And mainly I'm going to focus on the monopole locus, but to start with I will talk about this instant on locus very briefly, and I refer you to Lothar's lecture for more information. So <coughs> let's look at moduli of sheaves on S. So it's just uh, sheaves straight E with zero Higgs field. That has its own virtual cycle based on the deformation obstruction theory of sheaves on S, okay? Um, if you hate all this deformation theory, just consider the case where it's already smooth of the correct dimension, where this X2 here vanishes. So, yeah, you can already form this moduli space of sheaves on S. We know how to handle it in, um, in many different ways, but this is the most general case. So it has its own virtual cycle. But considered in this threefold theory instead of a surface theory, the obstruction it has extra deformations and extra obstructions. Okay, so you can start to deform the Higgs pair that lives in here. So you can start to deform the Higgs field that lives in here. So that's an extra deformation. And it's dual to the obstruction space. And it has extra obstructions here. They're the obstructions to deforming the Higgs field and they're dual to the original deformations. And you know, an exercise, you can really work that out. Uh, 
This is easier than the previous exercise because now my sheaf's supported on S, so it's much easier to resolve it, um, and this is how you do it. And you really just see that the deformations, uh, this is in the sheaf language. So when you, here's your curly E, it's just the push forward of straight E. When you take its deformation theory, you get the original deformation theory on S, but then you get this other piece, which is essentially the dual of that, up to a shift and um, a character of C star. Okay, <coughs> so in fancier language, this says that the, uh, when considered on X, you're taking a minus one shifted cotangent bundle of the derived scheme of sheaves on S. So that, that doesn't help anyone, I appreciate. Um, but the, what it's saying is that the, um, the virtual tangent bundle is the old virtual tangent bundle just of the surface theory, plus it's, it's dual, which gets shifted, and it picks up a character, and that becomes the virtual normal bundle. So that's the, that's the directions in which you deform the Higgs field. That's normal to this monopole locus. Okay, and from that you can compute, use the localization formula, you can compute what is the Euler class of this guy, and you can see it's very close to being just the Euler class of the virtual tangent bundle. And, or in fact, it's dual. And so what you find from that is that when you take this definition via localization of the waffer witten invariant, or at least the contribution to the waffer witten invariant from the instanton locus, what you get is this signed virtual Euler characteristic. And I use a different sign from Lota. And this has been heavily studied over 25 years, and the, the, really the state of the art in recent years is Goethe and Kuhl, which you heard about yesterday, and physicists, um, in particular Pierlin and Mancho and other people. Um, and there's this vanishing theorem that when the degree of the canonical bundle is negative, that's everything. So that kind of justifies studying this locus intensively. But I'm interested in the case where this vanishing theorem doesn't hold and where you get monopole contributions. And then we'll come back later to the interaction between these two contributions and how incredibly this estuality appears to swap the two. And so that means you can make predictions on one side or the other. Sometimes you can do calculations more easily on one side, sometimes on the other, and then the estuality switches them, and it's a very powerful tool, as, as Lota demonstrated yesterday. Okay, so I'm really interested in this monopole locus. So, for instance, here's what happens in rank two. So an exercise is... Um, Tensor a sheaf supported on two times the zero locus, so on this thickening of the zero locus, tensor it by this obvious exact sequence. To describe it in terms of rank one sheaves on S, so this piece will give you a rank one sheaf on S, this piece will give you a rank one sheaf on S, and there'll be a map between them up to tensoring with Ks, and both rank one sheaves will, let's assume everything's torsion free, they'll give you ideal sheaves, and the map between them will give you a nesting of the uh, two ideal sheaves. Uh, I will do that in more detail in more generality later. And what that corresponds to in Higgs language is that you can decompose the Higgs pair using the C star action. So you can decompose your vector bundle E in terms of a weight zero piece, which is fixed by the C star action, a weight minus one piece, which is not. And the Higgs, what you find is the Higgs field, remember it was off diagonal, it was this Jordan block. The Higgs field maps the E0 to the E1, okay? And the stability forces the EIs to be torsion free, so up to tensoring with a line bundle, they're ideal sheaves, and what it turns out is that this uh, phi ends up being a map between two ideal sheaves for, um, of subschemes of S. Right. So the, the, the green bit was doing it in sheaf language on X, the black bit is doing it in Higgs language on S. And so these monopole contributions have something to do with nested Hilbert schemes, and they're essentially the, computing with these things is the subject of the rest of the course, 
uh, and um, also eliminating other components. You know, in higher rank, there's other components where you get more than, where these aren't both rank one, this could be rank two and this could be rank one. And then uh, the rest of the course is about showing why they don't contribute and, and so on. Okay, that's just some history. So we, we did some computations a few years ago, just in very low degrees, before we had general methods for computation that I'm going to talk about in this lecture. And those computations were very hard work, and uh, Marta and Kuhl observed that our answers, which we thought were rather disappointing, turn out to give the first few terms of modular forms predicted by Waffer and Witten hundreds of years ago. So uh, here's what it was. Gertrude and Kuhl were already seeing these terms, this is, this is a cut out of a Waffer Witten paper, the Waffer Witten paper in 1994. Goethe and Kuhl were already seeing these terms, but they weren't seeing this first line. And um, what we were seeing with this term, the first four terms that we managed to calculate, Martin observed, were exactly this term, the first four terms of this. This is some generating series. And then this, so we were calculating, I think, with fixed determinant equal to the canonical bundle for convenience. If you calculate with fixed determinant equal to zero, you will get this term, and Laracker has done that computation since. Um, so uh, that, that was what told us that we have that this is the right definition that I've been giving to you. The other possible definitions that have been discussed are, are incorrect. Okay. okay, so this is saying that the bare end weighted definition that some of you will be aware of uh, gives the wrong answers. Okay, so I should uh, let me let me just do this slide. Okay, so more generally, uh, something in the monopole locus is fixed by C star. You can lift that being fixed by C star to prove using stability. You can you can show that what that means is that actually you can make C star act on the sheaf. You can make the sheaf be C star equivariant. And then you can decompose it using that equivariance into um, C star weight spaces, and you end up with a picture like this. So you split your bundle into pieces, and these are just the, um, these just correspond to the Jordan blocks, okay? So um, this is, you should think of this, in the, in the sheaf on X language, this is the bit supported scheme theoretically on S. This is the next bit supported on the first order thickening of S, and so on up to the kth order thickening, k minus one. And phi, which has weight one, because it's being scaled by the C star action, always maps from EI to EI plus one. And so you get this sort of chain of maps. And so this defines components of the fixed locus, labeled by um, Integers later will show that those integers have to be decreasing, otherwise you get it, it contributes zero. So you can think of this actually as a Young diagram or a partition, plane partition. Okay, so you get these components of the moduli space where these these are the ranks of these pieces. So these are the ranks of the sheaf. You've got the sheaf on this thickening of S, and it sort of has rank on its support. It has ranks. On different thickenings of S, you can look at how um, what what its rank is, and those are these Ri's. Okay. And the most important com components, as Lothar explained yesterday, are the two extremes, where the whole thing's supported on S, so everything's in E0. That's the instanton locus that he discussed, and I'm not going to talk about much. And then. Um, there's the other extreme where they're spread out as much as possible and they're all rank one, and that's these nested Hilbert schemes. So that's where the, the profile looks like this. He called this one to the R. And what we'll see later is that when your surface has a, a two form, by something called cosection localization, which I'll discuss, the only non-zero contributions come from constant profiles. So where all these ranks are, are the same. And where actually these phi's are generically um, isomorphisms, generically over the surface. So we'll discuss this later. But in particular, what it means is, and Lothar mentioned it, when the rank is prime, of course, there's no way of splitting up into constants like this. 
except for the two extremes. So when the rank is prime, so I tell you what a prime number is here, uh, only the nested Hilbert schemes contribute and the, and the instant on locus. Okay, so uh, all, all I'm doing here is setting up for next time, explaining why nested Hilbert schemes are important. They, they're really almost everything in varfer witten theory, or they're everything we know until now. And then this question was asked twice in succession yesterday. What about the first non, the case not covered by this? So that's rank four and this component two, two. Okay, and uh, um, I believe Sheshmani Yao have been thinking about this. Um, the issue is that these individual E's needn't be stable. Um, so but when they are stable, Andre has done a great deal of work studying, you know, um, correspondences between moduli spaces of sort of E0 and E1, set up by maps between them and so on. Um, the problem is that in general they needn't be stable because the stability condition is more complicated. So I think the idea of Sheshmani and Yao is that you should try and wall cross through some space of stability conditions to the situation where you have stable sheaves, where the two EIs are both stable. And if you could do that, then you could start to study uh, this problem. But uh, at the moment, no one knows how to do that. OK, okay so next time I'll start here with the semi-stable case. So far, I've always assumed that my sheaves are stable and that any semi-stable sheaves are actually strictly stable. Next time, I'll show you how to deal with the semi-stable case. Any question, comment? Don't be shy. Yeah. So just uh, it's off kind of why is it the monopole equation like uh, Bogomolny or Hitchin? Uh, sorry, a any other monopole equation related to this Rafa equation? Is yeah, I mean the Hitchin equation is essentially this equation, one dimension down, and there again you have a C star action, and you can localize to compact fixed loci, and you know Hitchin does that. Uh, yeah, no, no, that is not the question. question uh -huh. The monopole, means why you say monopole? Yeah. Is it oh, yeah, I, honestly, I have no idea. That's probably a bad... Uh, so, so in the original Waffer witten paper, they very briefly, in one section, mention that there do exist solutions which aren't just pushed forward, they aren't just instantons. And um, so they're interested in the rank two case, so what they end up with is two rank one sheaves, so essentially what we call in the nested Hilbert scheme. But in their case, they don't allow for singularities. They have two line bundles, and then they have this Higgs pair, which is therefore a section of a line bundle. It homs from one line bundle to the other. So they end up with a, an equation for a, a section of a line bundle. And the, the, this equation looks very much like the cyborg witten monopole equation, and they call it monopole. And then it's become known as monopole locus. I'm sure that's a dreadful name, right? But I, I'm sure Higgs is a dreadful name as well. So, yeah. Any more question? How, how, bad is, how badly does the Bielinski Birola decomposition work here? Ooh. Yeah, I mean, uh, what's sort of relevant is, is the, the virtual or derived version of that. And um, that, yeah, so my understanding is. Um, D Davesh has announced this localization formula, right? I, I think that's basically a derived version of this BB theorem. And he hasn't written it, right? And he never will. Which uh, formula? <laughs> okay, exercise. Uh, which, which formula are you talking about? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not an expert on this. Um, Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit nervous about saying anything because I, the, the versions I know are in the language essentially of the bare end function and so they're not entirely relevant to what I'm doing here. But there are different versions. So there's different refinements of DT theory where you take, um, you replace the bare end function by perverse sheaf of vanishing cycles and then there's other versions using K theory which I'm going to talk about. But they all have localization formulae. And uh, Davesh, has a has proved a localization formula which unfortunately hasn't written down 
but it's very much like a derived version of this BB um, formula or decomposition. Or, but let me not say more than that because I, I, I don't, I, you know, I'm starting to say things that I, I don't really know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you were to work with compact Calabria 3 fold, are there any way to put the condition here, like here, trace zero and fixed determinant in the intrinsic language of X? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, sometimes, but not usually. But usually, that it's it's done already for you. <laughs> um, let me, I'll, I'll come and talk to you about that later. Yeah. Um, often, often it's done for you. Like the very fact that you're deforming inside this Calabi Yau kind of stop, stops you seeing. It, it already looks like an SUR theory rather than a UR theory. Um, essentially, because the Calabi Yau, you probably assume, has no Jacobian, right? Um, and no H20. Uh, yeah, so then uh, physicists have since extended these estuality conjectures from Waffer Witten theory to the Calabi Yau case. So they, they predict that when you can calculate with two dimensional torsion sheaves in a Calabi Yau threefold, you should get modular forms. Without putting extra conditions. Without putting extra conditions. Yeah, there's no problem there. It's just the same as for the UR Waffer Witten equations. That's really just the local DT theory. Again, there should be s duality for that. It's just often a duality between zero and zero. Um, so uh, uh, th these, are, these are not the nicest modular forms. They're mock modular forms in general and they're vector valued modular forms. So they're, they're hard things to deal with, but nonetheless, yeah. So, you know, according to what I said yesterday, Gr gromov witten theory might be determined by some mo modular forms, some vector valued mo modular forms. But I, I'm I'm not convinced actually that that's a useful statement at all because the length of the vector gets bigger and bigger each time you try and pin something down and make a statement you find that you have to make the vector longer and then <laughs> you know you want to use modularity to say well there's only a finite dimensional uh, space of modular forms of this type therefore once I know 10 coefficients I know everything or something like that but you often find that once you compute 10 you find actually you need more because the length of the vector is longer than you thought and then, <laughs> I don't know, when you compute some more and you try and use our, our theory about how you, to go to between DT theory and gromov witten theory, you find some parameter has to get bigger in order to follow our theorem through and when that parameter gets bigger suddenly the length of the vector gets longer and yeah, it's not entirely clear yet that it's a useful theorem. So is there some hope for making this S-duality somehow mathematically? Uh, I think in the waffer witten theory, absolutely. I mean, that's kind of what... Well, where should it come from? Oh, I see. Well, well actually, geometric, yeah, geometric rather than mathematical. Yeah, I mean, it's really it's an artifact of formulae at the moment. But it's not some derived equivalent. I mean, yeah, I've often thought about it. I don't know. I mean, it'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. No, uh, yeah, the, at the moment, no. I mean, uh, you know, I'm going to explain how you're supposed to go between instantons, so sheaves on S, and these nested Hilbert schemes. The, the easiest way to see any kind of link is that nested Hilbert schemes, as I will describe via degeneracy loci, loci you can express in terms of just Hilbert schemes. So that's one way. That's, that reduces the theory to the theory of Hilbert schemes which gives you modular forms, vertex operators, and so on. Instantons, you can do something similar. You can do this Mochizuki wall crossing, where you, ve you take instantons plus another field, and then you start wall crossing in the space of stability conditions for them. And at one end, you get instantons. At the other end, you get Hilbert schemes again. You manage to decompose your bundle into sums of rank one bundles, and so on. And, um, there's another route to Hilbert schemes, and then maybe S-duality is is just relating these two th statements about Hilbert schemes. But it's awfully non-direct. Uh, is the integrand in the this Hilbert scheme points uh, integrator, do they even look similar ever to see this? I don't, not, not on the face of it, no. And you have to use lots of results of, you know, Nekrasov and people, integrable systems people and so on to 
lots of combinatorics, uh, to eventually see that the generating functions are related at all. Yeah, I, I think this is really a mystery. I mean, people should really... Are you reducing this S-duality at the level of instantons and some kind of others, like monopoles? But it's more general than that. It's, is it not... I mean, see here, as it seems that S-duality is like a kind of duality between the instantons on one hand and the other mm -hmm. hand monopoles, it's not... It's well, that's just one element of the S-duality group. There's others. Yeah. So even if you just form the instanton gen generating series or just the monopole generating series, those also have modular behavior. So, so it's more general. It's, it's yeah, yeah, I mean, it's not something we understand at all. Yeah. We have a question. So yeah. How does this S duality relate to the S duality for one dimension one she is on a compact trifold? Dimension one sheaves. Co-dimension one, okay. co one sheaves on it. Inside. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, there's a generalization of S-duality to that setting, which when you restrict to these non-compact Calabi owls, becomes the S-duality I'm talking about. Yeah. I have a question. When you say that the, the using the Berem function gives the wrong answer, it means yeah. simply that there is no physics counterpart to that numbers. Or is it yeah, that? yeah, that's right. Yeah, it, get, it gives very uninteresting answers. It also gives modular forms, but they're all just the eta function, and um, they're not they're not the numbers that physicists predicted. Yeah, okay. yeah. So if you take an arbitrary lambda instead of ks, do you expect some sort of quasi modularity? Or? Oh yeah, I don't know. You you need something like that line bundle to be have degree lower than the canonical bundle, otherwise you'll get X3s and stuff, you won't get a perfect obstruction theory. But then you could ask that, that's a great question, I have no idea. Yeah, I don't think anyone's done a single computation in that setting. Thank so if you're a Georg student, that, that's what you'll be, yeah. Uh, I think we can, uh, thanks uh, Richard. Thank you.